and many customers, they do uh, about as good a job as possible. So today our presenters are Sam Rubin, our Vice President of Palo Alto's Unit 42 team, and Michael McKinnon, Senior VP of Solutions from Global Gig. FYI, there are a couple of poll questions embedded in the slides, so, you know, kind of have fun and enjoy the presentation. Uh, for the poll questions, I'll be, I'll be responding. Put your answers in the chat and, you know, I'll make some pithy comment after the, uh, the chat is done. And if you have any questions or um, comments during the presentation, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat window. We can interrupt the speakers as appropriate or wait till the end when we'll have Q&A and you can ask your questions then. But let's try to make this interactive and as enjoyable as possible and as informative as possible. So with that, Sam, over to you, sir. Great, thank you, Mitch. And uh, thanks to Global Gig uh, for inviting us here. And um, thank you all for joining as well. Um, so Unit 42, um, Unit 42 is part of Palo Alto Networks, and we are the company's threat intelligence, incident response, and security consulting arm. Uh, you can back it up a slide. We're going to stay on that for, for a couple of minutes here. And um, for me personally, uh, I lead our services for North America. Um, I've been doing this for about 20 years, most of it in incident response, helping organizations respond to severe cyber threats, everything from... Um, insider threats to nation state advanced persistent threat. And so, you know, what we do at Unit 42 is we help organizations make threat informed approaches when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, the goal of threat intelligence is to help you make better decisions to protect your organization. You know, what this means is we all have scarce resources. Uh, we all have limited budgets, limited time, limited number of folks that can help us, but there's an almost unlimited number of cyber threats out there. Um, and so understanding what threats are most relevant to you um, and what you can do to have the greatest impact in defending against them is what Unit 42 is all about. And so our unique vantage point in doing that is we have a global threat research team of about 200 people um, looking at uh, vulnerabilities, tracking the threat actors, and helping take that information and put it in, putting it into the Palo Alto Networks products as well as providing services. Um, and what we also have is this global telemetry, this unique corpus of data from all of the products, from our firewalls, from our endpoint uh, Cortex XCR agents, from the cloud, um, obviously network rolling in. And so we have this view um, across the threat landscape of what's going on out there. Third, we, have, we do a lot of incident response. Uh, my team has about 120, 130 dedicated incident responders, and we're doing close to 1,000 incident response investigations a year for organizations that are hit with things like ransomware, things like supply chain attacks, nation state threat actors. And so we have a pretty good cross cut of what's going on out there. So if you jump to the next slide, what I wanted to do is share with you a little bit about what we're seeing in this threat intelligence, in this incident response uh, activity that we're going with. Facebook for Zoom. Hey, would you mind uh, muting Rohan? Thanks. And so um, really uh, my goal is to give you a bit of an understanding of what's going on and hopefully some recommendations along the way to stay safe. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover. This is just gonna scratch the surface and you can work with Global Gig, of course, or you know, with Unit 42 um, to help you understand these things in greater depth. But um, we're gonna cover three things at the highest level. We're gonna cover software supply chain attacks, we're going to cover ransomware, which is the threat we've all been talking about for a while, but what's changing? What can we expect? And then this emerging threat landscape that we're seeing of cloud threats. Um, so um, before we do that, I'd say I'd be remiss if I didn't start with, you know, what's going on in Eastern Europe uh, with the Russia-Ukraine cyber threat. So we're going to start there. So let's jump to the next slide. So... The question that everybody's asking is, at least here in North America, is what does this mean for us? What is the threat to us domestically for our organizations? Um, you know, we've all heard what CISA is saying with shields up, um, but the question is for how long? You know, our, our arms are getting tired uh, holding the, our shields up here, and this concept of vigilance fatigue—that is a real thing. So. What are we supposed to be defending against? 
And what, what should we be doing about it? And so to, to break that down a little bit, the concern is really about uh, retaliation by Russia to the sanctions that the US gover government has uh, put on, their, on, their, on them. And so what a lot of the intelligence communities, it believes is that um, when they realize that the sanctions are here to stay, that it isn't just some short-term uh, action, the threat of retaliation is going to escalate. And cyber, frankly, is the perfect way for them to do so. Um, Russia has demonstrated that they are a determined, sophisticated adversary. Um, they have targeted energy and finance sectors in other incidents. They have strong capability. An example of that is what happened at, with Saudi Aramco, uh, where they penetrated and were able to shut down their their, their systems from a IOT, uh, an ICS standpoint. And so what do we do? Uh, we need to have this defensive posture. Uh, we need to assume that there will be disruptive cyber attacks and it's this assumed breach mentality, which gets us back to shields up. Um, but really it's all about preparation. It's all about defense and depth. It's all about resilience um, and, and making sure that you know, if one thing is penetrated, you can see you have the detection capability, you have the ability to re recover and respond to mitigate the damage. Um, in terms of some of the specifics of what we're seeing, what my team has been tracking, uh, we see over 2,500 domains associated with uh, threat actors operating in the region, over 300 IPs, over 670 URLs, and over almost 300 different binaries, different malware binaries. And we do see them probing um, US power companies. You can think of it kind of like shaking the door to see what's there. Um, and in many respects, you can think of it almost like an ongoing Cold War, right? Um, in early April, uh, the FBI, for example, announced a takedown of a botnet called the Cyclops, Cyclops Blink botnet which was controlled, we believe, by the GRU, the uh, Russian um, uh, paramilitary and uh, intelligence organization. And this botnet um, had the capability of remote access, of password stealing, of sending um, traffic from the, the zombie computers to other uh, victim organizations for distributed denial of service. And so the FBI, uh, targeted the command and control servers and performed a targeted takedown and removed the malware and closed ports that the botnet was operating on. So this was a proactive action before anything ha had taken place. But this was one of the tools that we believe the GRU was putting in place to potentially levy a cyber attack against the U.S. So when we think about the threat, um, let's jump to the next category, the next slide here. We put it into uh, three categories. This is actually um, hacktivism. I'll talk about hacktivism first. One of the side components, uh, we've been talking about Russia, but there's been a lot of escalation in hacktivism. Um, it's almost like going back in time 10 years. When I was doing this 10 years ago, we were talking a lot about anonymous. Uh, we were talking about them targeting um, uh, various US entities that didn't operate uh, politically the way they wanted. So hacktivism is back. And I'm calling this hacktivism 2.0 because they're really leveraging the state of the art social media plat platforms, uh, ch chat platforms, WhatsApp, et cetera, to coordinate their actions, to recruit and to direct activity at um, organizations that aren't doing what they want. And one of the things that's scary about this to me is a lot of it, like you see in the screenshot, has been targeted at Western organizations because, for example, they're operating in Russia. And so um, what this means is, uh, or the question we're asking is, are we going to see an escalation of hacktivism in a way that we haven't seen for 10 years as they're sort of weaponizing these platforms, finding the potential of being able to recruit other, other hackers to uh, carry out attacks in an organized fashion. Um, let's see what we have here next. Let's jump to the next slide. So the other, the other threats that we're anticipating here, um, wipers. So we've seen a lot of variants used with success in Ukraine. So if you think about what happened with um, 
the Petya and not Petya attacks back in 2017 and the not Petya attack uh, obviously swept the world. These are destructive malware binaries that um, sometimes masquerade as ransomware, but there's really no payment facilitation. They're designed to do things like delete the master boot record and force a re reboot to wipe files. Some of them have worm capability that can spread through WMI or SMB. Um, they've got names like Whispergate, uh, Isaac Wiper, and we're seeing many, many variants of them out there. So that's one thing that we're keeping our eye on. Another category is file stealers, things like SaintBot and OutSteal. They're really designed to, once they're on a system, collect passwords, collect sensitive documents, and take information. And then the third category that we mentioned a little bit is this DDoS, um, distributed denial of services, things like the Cyclops botnet. Um, we've seen that be used over there. The Ukrainian telecom company, for example, was hit with a DDoS attack that took them down for a while. So there is question and concern about whether that could pivot um, to the United States. So um, I wanna pivot just in the interest of time uh, to talk uh, a little bit about a different threat that we're seeing, which is software supply chain attacks. So let's jump ahead. And I see in the chat there, we like questions. Yeah, please do fire them out if there's anything that, that you want to know. Um, software supply chain. So what we're talking about are cyber attacks that target third-party software and services that are used by companies in contrast with direct attacks. So the, the sort of marquee example that um, it's been over a year uh, was SolarWinds. And from my standpoint, doing IR and leading teams doing IR, this was really a tipping point, and we haven't gone back since. It was December of 2020. I remember kind of where I was when it, when it was announced, uh, and I certainly remember the month subsequent and what I was doing over the Christmas holiday, that period. Uh, we worked with over 500 organizations in that time. But since then, there's been a string of additional software supply chain attacks, and you can see some logos here on the screen that have impacted thousands of organizations, even those that are, you know, so-called, I would say, well above the so-called cybersecurity poverty line, meaning they have mature cyber, uh, capability when it comes to cyber. They've got people, they've got tools, um, but these supply chain attacks can kind of hit them out of left field and really impact them despite all the best practices that they're, that they're otherwise following. Um, another one that's sort of top of mind right there in the middle of the screen, uh, somewhat more recent was Log4j. This was a remote code execution vulnerability in Apache, um, identified being exploited in the wild in, in I said, early December. Um, NIST categorized it as a CVSS 10, which is as severe as it gets. It, it was easy to exploit. It was dangerous when it was exploit and it was widespread. And I will tell you, we are still seeing the fallout from this, even though it's been four or five months. Um, just earlier this week, we spun up a new incident response investigation, helping an organization out that um, we found, we traced the initial intrusion vector back to Log4j in a third party application that they didn't even know was vulnerable. So these, uh, these things are going to have a long tail of impact for organizations. Uh, let's jump ahead. I also think we have a question in the chat. Okay. With Kaseyan Exchange, I see it as data backup. How, how have the attacks impacted us from a DLP and um, BAS standpoint? It's BAS as backup as a service. So, so you, you're, you, Shane, you're saying the challenge is data backup? Or what, what's your, your point there, if you want to come off mute? Are you saying that if there are backups or other mechanisms to recover, it's not a problem? Or, or that's a method of remediation? What's the, what's the thrust to the question? Oh, sorry. I just want to find another standpoint for kind of addressing this. So kind of like for like the attack vectors, um, how does it kind of impact at least from folks who are working at least from backup of a service or something like data loss prevention? Um, oh. I see. So if you're, in other words, if your responsibility is to facilitate backup as a service or responsible for recovery for your organization, is that the question? Yes. 
Yes. So these mechanisms on the screen that, that those logos often, many of them will represent the initial intrusion vector. So back up a slide there, Taka. What, what you'll see with log4j, CodeCoff, the exchange zero day, um, you know, what happened with Kaseya, these are all, and the spring for shell one too, these are all, uh, if you think of the MITRE attack framework, which is like a kill chain of everything from how they got in to at the end of the day, what's the impact, what did they take and what happens in between, a lot of these, what they represent is how the threat actors get in, right? Like it is the mechanism by which they get in that the exchange zero day, you know, led to a shell uh, being dropped, which allowed the threat actors remote access. From that point, it's privilege escalation and moving laterally to do things like finding, disabling, or destroying backups. Um, if there's a third-party backup as a service solution, that's a great um, sometimes comp compensating control if it's not accessible by the threat actors, but that doesn't mean they can't use that access to, to do other things. Ransomware is one of the most common outcomes of this type of access, though. Yep. And th in that point to your, the, the ransomware aspect, so a view that I've seen, and it's been around for a while or whatever, is lateral movement within VMware environments to encrypt backups that are replicated offsite or to secondary systems, so that not only the attack vector hitting from the actual point of entry, it's skewing all the way down and, and locking the backups and replicated backups across the entire infrastructure. So That's if you right. have it, you're still, you're still at risk. Yeah, and let's actually pivot to ransomware. That's a great segue. And how am I doing on time? About another five, 10 minutes, is that, does that work? Yeah, about, yeah, about another 10 minutes. Perfect. So um, let's jump to the next slide. So uh, we talked about these supply chain attacks and I think this was a good setup because what this is what, the, the number one outcome, if you're a threat actor, there's simply no better way to monetize. Ultimately, if they're doing this to make money, there's no better way to monetize the unauthorized access you get than by locking things up, asking for Bitcoin or some other crypto or ex otherwise extorting the customer because of the access you get. And so um, no surprise, Ransomware continues to go up year over year. Um, our team performs about 300 ransomware incident response investigations a year. And so we track the threat actors. Um, we believe very strongly this is still threat number one um, that organizations should be concerned about. Um, one comment that I'll, I'll make just to give you a little sort of short-term context. We talked about like what's been going on since um, you know, the, the Russia, Ukraine, um, cyber threat and impact over there, we actually are seeing ransomware be down month over month, perhaps counterintuitively, but it is down, um, since the beginning of the year, this year, uh, in terms of the number of organizations being impacted. And the reason for this, um, some speculation, but we believe it's because of what's going on in Eastern Europe where a lot of these groups operate out of and they are distracted or otherwise disrupted in their, in their normal business operations targeting mostly North American based organizations. Um, if you're in Ukraine, you're not obviously facilitating ransomware right now. If you're in Russia, there's a debate and a question and we've seen by leaks, some of the threat actors are affiliated perhaps loosely, but somehow affiliated with the, the, the state there with the Russian government and they may be directing some of their activity towards Ukraine. And so actually there was an article out in the Wall Street Journal today with some of that same finding that ransomware is down month over month and that's consistent with what we're seeing in our response. Um, some of the stats, because we track it across our map, this is from our matters, uh, average demand 2.2 million, average payment about 541,000. There is a discrepancy, a lot of, uh, there's room to negotiate uh, with those organizations. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen quite a bit more of in the past year is the use of leak sites. So each of these uh, sophisticated threat actors will use a leak site and they'll take information and post it there as sort of proof of um, exploitation and proof of the ability to 
uh, exploit the 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 customer, um, and so we've seen that up eighty five percent compared to twenty twenty. Um, we've got another question here: PKI service providers are fully secure or not um, on target of these hackers? Um, I look. I, I don't know. I'm not going to speak specifically to Komodo and, and the others, um, but I would say nobody in the world is fully secure. So, um, but uh, we can we can leave that to what your conversations with them about their best practices and, and securing the organization. But uh, nobody out there in the world is full. There's no such thing as perfect security, right? Um, and that, let's go to the next slide. So no one is immune from ransomware attacks. We're seeing every industry, um, small businesses, large organizations, um, some of them you read about in the news, many of them you don't. Um, from our data, we see professional services and legal be very commonly attacked. Um, we think oftentimes in manufacturing too, we think a lot of these organizations are running on uh, out of date systems or, or things that aren't patched. And also in terms of their willingness to pay as a target, uh, disruption of their operations really means that the threat actors get a foothold in, in uh, coercing payment out of them. Um, the other trend we see with ransomware, which has been alarming, is that you know, if I were to go back five, 10 years in, in doing this work, there was sort of like clear dividing lines between what nation state threat actors were doing, leveraging zero days, and what ransomware attackers were doing, leveraging things like phishing, leveraging stolen passwords, and using sort of easier methods to get in. There's an incredible blurring of the lines now where we see ransomware threat actors increasingly use zero days in their, their exploitation. Uh, we saw 40 different zero days be used in 2021 across different technologies um, uh, impacted by the ransomware operators. Uh, the other big trend, which you've probably heard about is this expansion of ransomware as a service, which is a, a scaling model uh, adopted by the threat actors. Um, they had to adopt to COVID as well. And so the entrepreneuring uh, bad guys created a, mo a model where they run a platform. You can be a customer and get the ransomware you can get tech support. They can have help you navigate the victim environment, talk you through how much to um, uh, extort the customer for, all for a cut of the profits, which vary, you know, from from uh, platform to platform in the twenty percent range. So it's a model that they've scaled, and it's created an opportunity for um, would be somewhat uh, benign. Uh, hackers to become much more potent in their targeting and uh, ability to extract payment from us. Um, next slide. Um, we talked about this a little bit. We've got a lot of data on how much the, the difference between the payment and the um, demand amount. There is room to negotiate if you find yourself encrypted uh, about 42% about, uh, um, overall. Uh, on of the initial ransom demanded is what we have seen um, in in our matters. Um, let's move on, and uh, I'll try and wrap it up quickly here. I know I'm closely quickly running out of time. So the third trend I wanted to talk about is what's going on in the cloud. Um, we all know the way we've worked in the past two years has changed, and COVID accelerated our move to the cloud, uh, remote workforce. Here I am at home. Um, our use of SaaS applications and the convenience is awesome. The performance is amazing. Um, the availability is great, but because we now have so many of our apps and our data and our people outside of the, the perimeter um, of, our, of our corporate firewalls and our data center, our attack surface has just expanded tremendously. And so because of this, we're seeing understandably a huge uptick in cloud-based incidents. And it's not that the cloud or these SaaS applications are insecure. It's just that in the large part, many organizations haven't figure out, figured out a way to secure them properly. And uh, to, the, to the global gig team, maybe this is a good tee up for you when we talk about how you help organizations. But what we're seeing is a lot of misconfiguration and other user error, failure to follow best practices lead to very secure 
severe incidents. It takes one small misconfiguration to lead to something pretty big happening in the cloud. Um, the truth is, in my opinion, a lot of what goes on in the cloud mirrors what was going on for years on premise and at, at, at a HQ. But the difference is with the cloud, when you make a mistake or you have something that's not patched, it's not behind a corporate firewall, it's internet exposed. And the threat actors know this, they're scanning for those misconfigurations, they're using um, stolen passwords, they're getting in, and when they do, um, it leads to these outsized impact-based incidents. So um, in terms of some of the stats here, um, what all this means is that you know, in a larger state, um, because of the shift in cloud, because of DevOps spinning things up, um, because of all the changes that happen, um, we see uh, new vulnerabilities, whether it's a misconfig or software or something that's not patched, come up about every two, about, about two a day. Um, in terms of our work, we've seen 188% growth in cloud IR cases, and roughly now about a third of our matters touch cloud assets in one way or another. So we expect this trend will continue. Uh, we're investing very heavily in our skill sets and capabilities to help organizations in the cloud. Palo Alto Networks obviously has Prisma Cloud and a number of other products to help organizations be safe in the cloud. We're pivoting a lot of our other products to be better and, and more robust in that coverage as well. But wrapping it up, if you want to jump to the next slide, um, in summary, uh, there's obviously a lot going on out there in the threat landscape. I just scratched the surface. Um, Unit 42 is here to help you. Um, we help a lot of organizations with a incident response retainer, which basically puts our IR team on speed dial. Um, we do a proactive or cyber risk management consulting services. And we're here if you have an incident, uh, you can call us and we've got people available 24-7. Um, we publish a lot of research, two or three blogs a week about, for example, the uh, Eastern Yearn cyber threat on our blog, unit42.paloaltonetworks.com. And again, thank you for your time. And I'm going to hand it over to Mitch, I think, who's going to tee up a quick poll question for us. All right, next slide. All right, so this is a toughie. What are the CISOs, not Cisco, but what are the CISOs' two biggest cybersecurity fears? Please put them in the chat and we'll have some fun with this. We'll have more fun than CISOs do. Feel free to put your answers in the chat. Otherwise, you force us to have a little discussion of what we think they are. 10 seconds. <laughs> Getting fired for sure. Yes, data breaches, data leakage lack of visibility, these are all very, very valid. Budget, PI captured, really good. So, you know, there is no real right or wrong answer to this question, but we know that with the whole COVID thing and everyone moving remotely and working remotely and now it's obliterated the network borders, the new border is identity. So managing security in this, a uh, diversified environment is definitely one of the biggest issues and making sure data is protected. So zero trust is a, a big thrust for a lot of companies today. So good one, I appreciate it. And uh, now over to you, Michael. Hey guys, so uh, Sam, thank you very much. And, and just so you guys know, I as well have been in this industry for 20, 25 years. Um, Conversations I've had with Sam so far have been extremely informative and he's very well versed on what's actually going out there. So, so take what he says at heart. Um, it's one of the reasons that we enjoy working with Palo as much as we do. Um, they have a deep insight into the market and, and understand what's actually going on, not just with marketing. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is kind of what Global Geek does, why, how we align with Palo, how we kind of enable a lot of what Sam talked about and kind of step back a little bit and, and start looking at the, the perimeter side and, and how that kind of pushes in. So for you guys that aren't familiar with Palo Alto's SD-WAN and, and SASE solutions, overall, 
Uh, Pell has done an extremely good job of, of stacking that from, from an edge perspective and, and edge in this case can be as far as the remote user all the way down into the core network itself. Uh, what we found is in doing this, um, I've been at SD-WAN, doing SD-WAN, quote unquote, for probably five to six years, early, early days of that. Um, been an, an engineer, been a director, been VPs for many different organizations. And, and what I've seen throughout the history of that is we're finally kind of at that point to where I think anybody that sits in this world understands that we're always talking about security. We're already trying to get budget for security. We're always trying to justify security. Well, now we have that justification that's sitting in front of us. And it's a great opportunity to start chasing that down and, and closing those gaps that exist today. So um, what I've seen for the most part through this is um, a lot of us live in the world that we've got multiple point products out there. We've got solutions and software and endpoint devices and firewalls and everything that's out there that's kind of feeding us all this information, but the visibility is still pretty scattered. So go to the next slide if you can. Um, it kind of leads into the fact that we were transitioning as we kind of go through this from, from the bolt on security aspects of what we're kind of used to, meaning we've got multiple products. So we're targeting different layers of the stack where we have data centers that have certain type of firewalls. We have remote users that have X. We have branch sites that have a different type of firewall or potentially it's all vendor aligned, but we're not getting to the point that we need to where we have that clear visibility end to end. So that as that threat landscape expands, we're able to identify that and remediate that as much as possible and as quickly as possible and get further down into that stack so that we can manage that end to end for the customers. So when we start looking at how we solve that uh, from a product standpoint, but also from a methodology standpoint, that's kind of where we step in with a lot of our customers. Um, we look at the customer's full aspect of their network from a discovery perspective, from an application standpoint, and we start to align product sets and, and management and technologies that give us the ability to take all of that information and start at that edge and start protecting all the way out to that edge. A lot of what Sam talked about, you know, when it comes to the threat landscape and how it's expanding, um, the threats over in, in Europe, um, the threats that are local here and how they are increasingly getting higher. Um, it's interesting to see uh, the conversation he had about ransomware and how we've seen that drop down. But to his point, I agree. Now you've got focused efforts and they're very targeted efforts. So as we continue to push through that and if things keep going down, how do we solve that from a C level, from a director level, from an engineer level, but more importantly, from a customer experience level so that we are making sure that we are able to identify those, prevent those from a breach perspective. And if and when, because they eventually will, some do make it through, how do we resolve that from a remediation standpoint? Uh, step to the next slide on that, please. So if we look at the market and we go back to where Gardner coined the frame SASE, um, a lot of people today still have the idea that, that SASE and SD-WAN are separate products. Um, I've taken the mindset that SASE contains SD-WAN now because um, what we're trying to look at is, is how do we solve that full stack up? Uh, mobile users, how do we protect east to west traffic? So that traffic that's going between data centers, how do we protect that that's going on or between uh, internally as well when we get into micro segmentation, cloud enablement. Um, Sam touched a lot on like what that threat landscape looks like today. And it's, it's also interesting to me as we've seen the transformational world go those on-prem data centers have been moving to the data center. So those same problems fall along with it. So we have to get more visibility of what's going on in there. How do we micro segment that? How do we protect the edge and the perimeter of that as well? Uh, when we start looking at combining those, um, the cost savings is inherent to that. But more importantly to me um, are probably the, the last two things on this and what I see more often than not, and that's the improved endpoint and user experience, meaning my users are secure wherever they are, wherever they go, whether that be a branch, whether that be a coffee shop, whether that be at their own home and that threat protection and increased visibility. Um, point products are great and they've served us to this day and I still think they have a place in the market or whatever, but with everything that's going on now and the convergence of a lot of this technology down to software defined, we need to have that increased visibility across the entire landscape so that we can target those and block those and then 
if they do get through, how do we continue to remediate those quicker? Uh, step to the next slide. So, so this is a quick snapshot on what a SASE from a full stack perspective looks like. And this is, this is aligned as well, all the way up from the Palo side. And where we're really starting at this and where we really need to start focusing on the, the protection of this and how it goes up is that bottom level. So mobile users, branch retail sites, oftentimes those retail sites can be, if we look at logistics, it may be a mobile van. It may be some type of catering. It may be some type of manufacturing or trucking that we need to start to look at as well. How do we start protecting at that layer and move up that stack? And what you'll notice as you kind of move through that, SD-WAN is where that actually starts. And then we push up further into that all the way to those data centers, breakout internet, any of the SaaS applications that we're using, public cloud. And we get that full stack that gives us that view and control from an application layer and a security layer that we can see that all the way through um, when we move up to that. And what we're looking to do is try to not only just increase the performance of that traffic and be able to policy it from an application perspective, but also protect that traffic and make sure that what often gets thrown around is first packet, meaning is the minute that that user is mobile and they open up a laptop or they open up their phone, that first packet out is inspected and pushed through that stack from the SD-WAN side. It's inspected in Prisma Access if it needs to go that way, all the way to those data center applications or the public cloud side. So a couple of things I'll, I'll talk on, um, you know, I, I look at business cases a lot and like how, how have we solved current customers and, and what was the output of that? This is a fairly typical customer for us. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of verticals that we target, but the more interesting thing that I've seen over probably the past 24 months or whatever is it, this applies to just about any vertical that you're in. Um, oftentimes you can silo, you know, in, in FinTech or, uh, in manufacturing, especially on the IRT side, oil and gas, whatever. But these, the, the way that the landscape has changed, there, there are high targets that are higher, but everybody's being affected to this. There's no single targeted, hey, if you're in this, you're 100% at risk. So, so when we go through and we look at this use case specifically, it's a big CPA firm. Um, they came to us with kind of a typical scenario of, hey, we have a disparate network, multiple products, uh, multiple offices, no way to actually look at the application performance. So if their ERP is not working or their, the applications that the CPAs were utilizing over you know, remote terminals or over VPNs, we have no way to actually identify where we need to improve that if they have issues. Um, circuit underlay. Um, oftentimes when you're looking at how do we solve a network issue or challenge, that gets overlooked. Um, do these sites, these retail, the, the remote sites, the branch offices, do they have diverse connectivity? Are they on legacy MPLS? Does MPLS still serve that? So uh, here, what we'd like to do is we'd like to start at that underlay layer and kind of move up. So let's solve the network case, the underlay, identify the challenges that may be there. Maybe they're undersized or overpaid and start solving from that side so that we've got a clean network to work off of validate that and start moving up from the topology in that side and start looking at the WAN side, the, the edge side for each one of these and start building a solution up from that that encompasses all of these products, but also the management and the solutions and services that go around it so that all encompassing a company can look at this overall solution that's being proposed and say, it checks the boxes for all of this. In this case, Anybody that has experience with SOC 2, we love it and we hate it at the same time, but that was a big driver in this case. And anybody that's gone through that understands the compliance around being able to check the boxes of auditing. If you go through a SOC 2 audit, being able to provide the logs, the data, the information as far as users that are onboarded, offboarded, their abilities to be able to be tracked from the network, if they're off the network, what does that traffic look like? It really becomes a challenge when you have eight to 10 point products across the organization that aren't integrating that information are able to centrally gauge that information and present it to an auditor during your audit phase. Next slide, please. So what we kind of did here um, overall is we, we went into this and we, and we do what we typically do. We do a full discovery uh, from a network architecture, implementation, documentation, and planning, and really work with the, we work with this customer to come up with a plan on what this looked like. I tell everybody that I talk to, I never go into a call with a customer trying to place software or hardware. I go in trying to identify what those business cases are, what those pain points are. 
What is the overall goal to try to solve for this? And then identify the products that fit for that. So as we kind of walked through with this customer and, and looked at this, and you'll see a very high level diagram here of what this ended up looking like, is we decided along the ways with the direction they were moving, a lot of the users were working remote. A lot of that was driven by COVID. A lot of it was just driven by how they were actually deploying their stuff today that SD-WAN made a lot of sense here. And what we, we actually ended up doing is deploying SD-WAN in their data centers, deploying SD-WAN at their branch sites and enabling Prisma access, which is the mobile user side. And if you look at this diagram over to the right, where Okta is tied into that, into Prisma access, this kind of serves as a uh, overarching global hub point that any users, wherever they're at in the world, can actually access this. And the interesting thing that you'll see, because there's, there's lots of solutions out there that, that, that touch this and do parts of this, is that all your security components can be held up in here. So if that user is working at a branch site and they move off and they need to go home or they need to travel or whatever, and they end up in, let's just say Paris for whatever reason, and they're traditionally working out of Chicago, they're gonna access that local Prisma access hub from here and flow over that network directly to the data center for whatever applications they have with the same security policy and the same visibility and the same rules as they had at their branch site. Same applies to any kind of cloud infrastructure they have. So, so in this case, we deployed uh, Prisma uh, SD-WAN within the IaaS as well. I believe it was Azure on this side. And it gave the same visibility for those applications that were sitting up there. And the transition between that from a management perspective looks no different. Whether that user is sitting at that branch or that user is remote, those policies are the same across the board. So it gives that visibility to the CISO side, to the SEC teams, to the operations as well, to increase that visibility from a security standpoint, check those boxes. And oftentimes those are being tied to cybersecurity policies nowadays as well but also the ease of management uh, and ease of use for the customer itself and the customer being the end user, the employee in this case. Uh, we also at each one of these went through and itemized and determined that the circuits that were in the underlay of it, uh, we could save some costs there over their existing network that they had before and actually work through project managing that, deploying those in tandem with this solution end to end. Um, we do field services quite often. Um, oftentimes, and this is a world I lived in forever, We've got a large global company. Um, the IT staff is tied with putting fires out. They can't travel everywhere. So in this case, we deployed field services to do the rack and stack at each one of these sites, including the data centers, and really kind of get a turnkey package to the customer so that where they're at today and where they're going, we kind of work in tandem with them along the way. And the tail part of that with us that really I find is beneficial to a lot of customers is we try to attack these when we're working with Palo is a true co-managed solution. Um, I am not of the mindset that if you're gonna deploy this solution for a customer that they have only read-only access or can't do anything. Um, we work on change control management policies at the end of this. We wanna work in tandem with the teams that are available. I find more often than not, um, it tends to free up a lot of time to really focus on projects. So, so we're solving a lot of the underlying issues from security and connectivity standpoint. We're also freeing up time so that continued projects can be focused on. And we become that management company that gets escalated to are proactively identifying where these issues exist, reaching out to whatever the escalation list are and, and really kind of helping the customer focus on their core business where they need, but step in anytime that they want. Next slide, please. This is, this is a slide that if, if any of you guys have ever been on a call with me, I really focus on a lot because this methodology that we go to touches on something that, that Sam talked on as well, as far as those deployments that are deployed halfway are they're deployed not with, with best effort or best practices, mainly because of the strain on resources or time that come into there. This methodology as a whole is what we apply to just about any solution that we deploy out. Um, the key things that I like to point out is these first two phases that are in here. This is where you win in a project in understanding these. The, the customer story, the use cases, applications, user experience, culture, and growth strategy. I repeat this 20 times a day when I'm talking to people, because this is the part I think a lot of people miss, and it's not intentional. It is just more that how do we dedicate the time to go through and walk through this when we don't fully know what we need, but we know we need something. Uh, we don't fully understand the objective of when we're deploying SDN, where do we solve this case and solve this business case, but also taking a fact that in 18 to 24 months, 
we may be doing M&A and acquiring other companies. And so walking customers through this from a discovery standpoint, this is a third of the projects. And most time when we're going through this, as we kind of go into the design phase, the output of that to, to you guys, and this is something I fully, anybody that you're working with, you should expect is what is the high level diagrams that like, like, why are we choosing this platform option? What are my connectivity options and, and how do we define like what you're actually doing during this and get in lockstep with the deployment so that there's a statement of work and there's a bomb aligned with that, that we're all agreeing on from a phased approach and how we roll this out. Sometimes rollouts are smooth. Oftentimes we're replacing underlying, underlying MPLS circuits, or underlying connectivity. So there may be ETL fees associated with that, that we've got to take into account. So building that project plan out where there's three months, six months, I have a customer now that we've been working with for almost three years now for a very large global deployment because we have to term this along the ways as we go. And we built a full plan for that. And we're checking in from each phase, building the success criteria for each phase and making sure we work through that. And it's, it's a long-term project. So taking those in account, make the decision a little bit easier so that you're not just fighting for budget for something, but worrying about what you're double paying on. Um, the align and achieve phase in a lot of this, uh, to me, the alignment is where we're doing that review and we're doing workshops with you guys so that we review this as we're going through it. Our project managers are developing project plans. We're sitting down with a project team if you have one, if not, whoever the point is. And we're making sure that we're staying accountable through that. Um, I tell this to some people, you'll see it if you ever get an SOW from me, that project plan has milestones built into it. I refuse to do a project with a customer with a milestone without a milestone payment in it, meaning that We'll, we will not accept payment on a project until we've hit that milestone within that phase. And that's kind of keeping everybody honest with each other and making sure that that last part, that customer acceptance, you're getting what you're asking for. We're solving those use cases. We're solving the, those objectives and, and, and expectations before we even move on to that next phase. And the last phase in this is the achieve phase. Uh, achieve to me is day two type support. It's that success criteria. It's transitioning to our knock. It's transitioning to what that ongoing management looks like so that when an issue arises, you know what's going to happen, where, where it's going, how it's being escalated. And we're proactively reaching out to you, the supplier, the carrier, whoever it may be during that process to make sure that that solution, either it be from an edge perspective, a security perspective, a circuit performance perspective, you're getting that wrapped all up in so that the day-to-day -day becomes much simpler for you guys. Uh, next slide. I, th I think this kind of just summarizes, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here real quick because I, I think a lot of this is what I said, but, but you know, when we're looking at stacking the SASE solutions from an SD-WAN and security and management and alignment perspective, these really are kind of the key things that we look at. What are we accomplishing? And the three things on, on the left are, are summarize all of this. Increased visibility that applies to security, it applies to application performance, user experience, reducing the complexity of multiple point products and multiple vendors and really aligning with the business goals so that when we get to that point, you guys and, and Global Gig and Palo, we're all on the same page and knowing that we want to accomplish this. And that's, that's super important when we're doing large projects like this, our complex projects and understanding that SD-WAN and security is not, it's not something that's uncomplex or we will probably wouldn't be on this call to be honest with you and it's ever changing. So that's it for me. Um, these are a couple of customers that we have today. Um, some of these you may recognize, some of them may not. Um, we really work in a lot of different verticals from small to large, uh, but you'll probably recognize some of these. And, and a lot of these successes that aren't here are attributed directly to Palo and, and their product set and their expertise as well. Great, Michael. Awesome. Hey, Sam, Michael, great presentation. Really thank you for your participation. Audience members, thank you for participating and hanging in there. Uh, so, you know, the last few minutes, we'd like to open up to any kind of Q&A. There's been some good dialogue in the chat, but um, please take yourselves off mute and participate in any Q&A if there are any questions. <clears throat> I have a question, it's Sam, uh, maybe a bit of a softball, but uh, to the Global Gig team, how does a customer know when, like, what are the pain points that the, they're feeling commonly when they're like, well, maybe we're ready for something new here, for something like you just positioned? 
Yeah. Um, pain points for me, and usually on a, on a transformational side. So, so I see, I always say there's probably two to three that I generally see legacy infrastructure, um, whether that be from a circuit perspective, aging networks, aging hardware refreshes, um, a pain point that's becoming more apparent. Um, and you touched a lot on this is cybersecurity requirements. You know, those policies that, that are getting insured now aren't just as easy as checking the boxes anymore. We have to prove a lot of this stuff out. So especially in finance, I'm seeing a lot of this. Um, more often than not, most, most of the time when I'm on a call, it's, it's a lot of understaffed. Um, understaffing, um, the ability not to serve the solutions or the applications as, as well as they did before and keep on top of the cybersecurity landscape at the same time. Makes sense. <clears throat> All right, well, um, doesn't look like you really have any more Q&A. So uh, any closing comments by any of the participants, the uh, just Michael and Sam, or we'll just call it a wrap. I'll, I'll say just say I, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate the I'll, I'll say thank you guys. And, and the, the thing I always put out whenever I do these is you may not want to buy from us, but if you've got questions, call me. My job, and I'm sure Sam's the same way, like we, we want to educate the market on what's out there and what's actually going on so that you guys can make informed decisions. So any kind of questions that come up on stuff like this, or if you're in a project, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn by email. I'm happy to have a conversation anytime. You know, informed decisions are the best case of a customer being happy. Wherever that goes is where it goes, but that's really why we do these. Make sure that you guys are in the right position to make the right decision educated wise so that you don't end up 18, 24 months from now going, what did I just do? And that's really a key point. Uh, the fact that you have a global gig at your beck and call, they can accelerate your education. They have a broad view of the marketplace, the various vendors and products out there and solutions out there. Yeah. So um, rather than spending endless days researching via Google, reach out to Michael and he can answer your questions quickly. I'm very direct and honest. So um, most people like what I say. Sometimes they're like, that's not what I wanted to hear, but it, it will be as educated and informed as I can get. When you say, Michael, your network stinks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It, it is what it is, but the goal is how, how do we change it from that? And that's, <laughs> that's where we get the success from. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Greatly appreciate it. Hope you learned something today and put Michael on your speed dial. Yep. Thank right. you guys so much. And thank, thank you, you very much. Take care. Enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you. Hey. All right, Taki, you can end uh, the, the webinar. <laughs>